Good afternoon. It's Thursday, the 5th of January 2017. Welcome to UK Column News, just after one o'clock. Uh, and I'm joined today by uh, Vanessa Bailey. Apologies for the uh, incorrect lower third there. Brian is not, in fact, with us, uh, although the lower third said he is, and hopefully he will be back tomorrow. But uh, Vanessa, welcome to the programme. Um, how are things? You're, I take it you're back from uh, Syria now? <laughs> yeah, I got back uh, actually on pretty much New Year's Eve. So um, I've only been back a few days. And uh, tell us, uh, what, how was it uh, over Christmas in Syria then? Um, it, it was an extraordinary um, mix. I mean, I was uh, very fortunate to be in Aleppo, actually, during just before Christmas, during the actual liberation. And then at Christmas, um, after the full liberation and evacuation. Um, so it was wonderful to be involved in the very real uh, celebrations by people of both uh, East and West Aleppo, uh, the people of East Aleppo to be liberated and the people of West Aleppo to one, be reunified with their families in East Aleppo, but also to be free from the almost daily deluge of mortars and sniper fire, suicide bombers, explosive bullets that they'd endured for the last almost five years. Okay, well, look, um, I think what we're going to do then is we're gonna, we'll talk about what's going on in Syria uh, now shortly. But before we do that, I want to have a look again at, uh, at the mainstream media coverage uh, in recent weeks in the last couple of months, uh, and also at a couple of the people that uh, the mainstream media is relying upon for their information about Aleppo, because, I mean, you have been receiving um, some <coughs> pretty horrendous attacks uh, recently, uh, accusations that you weren't actually in Aleppo, for example. But, <laughs> but uh, let's just have a look at some of the people that uh, that um, the mainstream are relying upon for the information. Mm -hmm. And we'll start off with Wab, uh, sorry, Wad Al Khatib. Um, uh, she is uh, an award-winning filmmaker, apparently, and uh, Channel Four News have used her exclusively uh, mm. in their InsideAleppo.com series. Um, give us a bit of background. Um, well, Wad Al Khatib is actually the um, wife of uh, so called Dr. Hamza Al Khatib, who uh, we'll talk about very, very shortly as well. Um, and in fact, uh, in the last few days um, prior to the full liberation of East Aleppo, uh, Jon Snow was tweeting that they, Channel 4, were very concerned about their camera woman. And I think this was the first time that it was actually admitted that, that she was, to some extent, exclusively Channel 4's um, project inside East Aleppo, which, which is very interesting. At the same time, uh, she was being endorsed by um, Channel 4 um, for, uh, as being a recipient of two Amnesty International Media Awards for her camera work inside um, East Aleppo. Um, so we've got The Guardian promoting her, we've got she's mainly working for Channel 4, and we've got one of the major NGOs uh, giving awards to this lady. Mm, absolutely. And of course, you know, if we go back to the um, Libya um, war, or, or let's say the reduction of Libya to a failed state by the NATO no-fly zone. And if we look at Amnesty International's role in facilitating that no-fly zone at the time and how um, later much of what they had been propagating as um, the narrative against Gaddafi and against Libya effectively was proven to be fake. Now, yet again, we're seeing Amnesty International supporting and awarding um, a camera woman who we will see very shortly um, can only be described as um, connected to, if not fully supporting, Nusra Front Al Qaeda inside Syria. Um, so this is her husband, is that correct? Mm. Yes, this is her husband. Um, I keep saying so-called Dr. Hamza Al-Khatib, and I have suggested to Channel 4 that they check with Aleppo University whether this um, doctor, as he calls himself, um, ever actually qualified from Aleppo University. And uh, just give us his full name again. 
His full name or his full stage name, let's say, is Dr. Hamza Al-Khatib. Okay, and it's not just Channel 4 News that's promoting uh, Dr. Hamza because uh, here he is uh, on uh, Newsnight as well. Mm -hmm. Yes. And, uh, and uh, is this the elusive last doctor in Eastern Aleppo? <laughs> He, yeah, I mean, he was regularly described as the last doctor in East Aleppo, um, particularly in his petition um, to President Obama. Right. So, that, so here we go. His petition on change.org, which, and he describes himself as being, well, he's, he says he's one of the very last doctors. Yeah. Um, so, uh, but the mainstream media uh, absolutely pushing him being the last doctor. And uh, mm. no matter how many others left or, were alleged to have been killed or injured. He meant to, well, he... and also, you know, not forgetting the 4,160 doctors uh, in West Aleppo that were completely disappeared by this mainstream media who insisted upon their last uh, pediatrician, their last doctor, their last clown, uh, their last gardener, and running out of all the various lasts that they produced in their propaganda. Um, but, but what basically they were doing was completely disappearing the 1.5 million Syrian civilians in West Aleppo and the 4,160 doctors in West Aleppo. Uh, indeed. Now, um, this uh, shot here is from a video, mm -hmm. uh, which I think is a demonstration taking place in Idlib. Is that right? That's right. Yeah. In fact, um, this goes to show one thing very clearly, uh, that Hamza al-Khatib uh, left on the buses with um, the Nusra front-led uh, terrorist and militant factions who were the last to be um, deported or evacuated from the East Aleppo districts. So he did not stay, in other words, with the civilians that he claimed to have been treating and rescuing for the last um, four plus years. He left with the Nusra Front um, delegation, let's say, that had been imprisoning, starving, executing, torturing and depriving those civilians that he claimed to be treating of humanitarian aid, food, any sort of medical assistance for the last four and a half years. And that statement is based upon the testimony of those Syrian civilians um, that, that were um, allowed to escape from the East Aleppo districts. OK, well, here, here's an image of him. Uh, he's on the right hand side there. Uh, and he seems to have his arms around um, a gentleman with a beard and, uh, and a scarf. Um, mm -hmm. Who is that person that he's uh, well, quite close I, to? Well, I mean, you know, this is this is very interesting. Um, if we bear in mind what we've just mentioned, that um, Hamza Al Khatib was really the poster boy for the mainstream media, corporate media narrative against Syria. He was used in his letter to Obama to be calling for a no-fly zone, which you know, again, we know that this would have been a repeat of uh, what happened in Libya. One but would also potentially have engendered a war with uh, between the United States coalition and Russia on Syrian soil and certainly exacerbated the, the bloodshed for the Syrian people and their suffering. Um, now, this guy uh, on the left, and he's clearly tagged in this photograph, so, so there's no... Um, there's no doubt over his identity. This is Almayev. Almayev is um, basically the second in command of Nor al Din Zinki, uh, who is the terrorist group, although it, it's being funded by the United States. The United States has never admitted that um, the crime they committed, the public beheading of a 12 year old Palestinian child, Abdullah Issa. Um, was a crime against humanity. They've never accepted that. And as far as I am aware, they have continued to fund this group while refusing to designate it a terrorist group. However, its actions in, in publicly beheading a 12-year-old child, while previous to the beheading, they'd been humiliating and torturing him, is an act of terrorism. And here we see uh, Channel 4, BBC, CNN poster boy, Hamza Al-Khatib, hugging um, not only, uh, you know, a member of Nor al Zinki, the second in command, and actually present at the execution um, of Abdullah Issa. Uh, you've, we've got to ask, I mean, we'll, we'll ask this question again in a moment, Vanessa, but we've got to ask, where does this leave uh, mainstream reporting? 
Well, I mean, it should leave it in the gutter where it belongs. I mean, this is extraordinary. You know, while Alex Thompson is saying to me on Twitter that I shouldn't be using the term terrorist because it's an abusive term and it designates cheerleading. Um, here we have a clear example that for the last four and a half years, Channel 4 has effectively been cheerleading for terrorism. And, you know, um, they and the BBC, in fact, all corporate media, as I have said, have spent the last five years claiming to be protecting the civilians inside East Aleppo. Whereas now what is being exposed and revealed, which is what all of us have suspected for the last five years, is that in reality, they've been protecting um, the terrorist and militant groups led by Nusra Front. Again, this information is not something I'm, I'm creating out of thin air. This is coming from the testimony of the Syrian civilians leaving East Aleppo, that the predominant group was Nusra Front, which is Al-Qaeda in Syria, that the um, majority of the other 22 estimated brigades of militant and terrorist factions, including Aral, Sham, and Norald and Zinki, were under the control of um, Nusra Front, which is Al-Qaeda. And if we look at those activists and those groups that have been used by the corporate media, including Channel 4, to, to basically um, promote their narrative, which of course is in line with the UK regime, um, regime change agenda inside Syria, um, the majority of them are running with Nusra Front. They're, they're, they're affiliated to and allied to extremist factions inside East Aleppo that have been torturing, executing, starving the people that this corporate media has been claiming to be protecting. It's one of the most um, criminally hypocritical um, deceptions and propaganda projects that I think we've ever witnessed. And, and the fact that this has gone on for almost five years and has ensured the wholesale suffering of those civilians, both in East Aleppo and in West Aleppo. It, it, I mean, it, it, it's, I, I'm actually pretty speechless over it. Um, well, just before we uh, show one final image on this, uh, I just want to clarify, of course, the Alex Thompson you're talking about is not the same Alex Thompson that was on with us on no. the UK <laughs> column news yesterday. No, apologies. To, to Alex Thompson that was on yesterday. This is Alex Thompson of Channel 4. Yes. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, and uh, just uh, just finally, we've got the same doctor then with more uh, Al-Qaeda, uh, well, Al-Nusra yeah. people. Uh, and this time, looks like he's looking at a map. What could they possibly be doing there? Well, this was actually taken um, from, I think this was taken from a Nusra Front um, a propaganda page. Um, and this was actually um, probably about a few months before the liberation of East Aleppo. And again, um, I posed the question to Channel 4, I never received an answer, is why they were um, using as their poster boy Hamza al-Khatib, where here he is seen um, with uh, two terrorist factions pouring over maps of the battleground in al Ramusa. And of course, again, this was just before um, Channel 4 released the video, which they then took down, where they basically showcased um, Norald and Zinke, uh, calling them rebels and normalizing their suicide bombing attacks against the Syrian Arab army and against the Syrian people in West Aleppo. So, you know, this extraordinary litany of, 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 um, of terrorist propaganda that Channel 4 has been producing and running with without verifying and without doing the background checks on on the activists or the doctors um, or the citizen journalists that they've been using um, to basically produce the news for them from East Aleppo, while, as I said, effectively disappearing 1.5 million people in West Aleppo. Um, okay, so um, we're going to... Before we can... Sorry, we're, we're going to uh, show a quick uh, video in a second. Uh, John Snow uh, interviewing... Just tell us who he was interviewing. Ah, oh, yes, this was the um, the Jon Snow interview with uh, Farah Shahabi. Farah Shahabi is a, an Aleppo MP, an independent MP, so he's not affiliated to the um, Syrian government Ba'ath Party. He runs as an independent MP, but he's also the head of the Chamber of Commerce in Aleppo.
Okay, so what I've done here is because I just wanted to sort of uh, highlight the the type of questioning uh, that John Snow mm -hmm. was offering here. Um, so we've just cut out the questions themselves just to make this point, um, and uh, and so we'll we'll watch the questions and then we'll have a comment about it uh, just quickly afterwards. Before we came on air, I spoke to Faraz Shahabi, a pro-regime MP for Aleppo. Testimony of the civilians that we came to is yes. that they were bombed from the air by barrel bombs dropped by uh, aircraft belonging to the Syrian and Russian air forces. But all afternoon there were artillery shells coming in uh, and they were coming in from the Syrian army. But, but this, the people who are dying are not terrorists, they are civilians. They, you can see them, you speak to them. These are yes. children, they are young people, uh, and they're very old people, and they are not terrorists. The civilian we... population there is perfectly clear, they do not wish to live under Mr. Assad. They do not wish to live under your regime. They wish to be free. Mr. Shahabi, I'm sorry, but there is no government on earth at this moment that has killed as many of its own people as yours has. Your own constituents, your own friends, you claim, they have been killed by the government. Flying planes, dropping barrel bombs. You are the MP for Aleppo. Your yeah. own constituents are dying from your own air force and you don't do anything about it. You don't this seem is... to care a damn about your that, own constituents. Absolutely... And if that is the case, them. Mr. Shahabi, why do you bomb the hospitals in which your own constituents, your own civilians, are seeking aid to help them repair the wounds that your airport, Air Force really? has inflicted? And then what do you say to the 45 civilians today killed in East Aleppo, killed by barrel bombs, bombs and artillery? Bombs. Look, if you are going to legitimise and beautify the existence of terrorist activity in, in, inside my city, you will, you will not get any approval of me, from me, or from any citizen in Aleppo. I had to, uh, I had to give Mr. Shahabi the, the last word there, because that interview style was, Vanessa, just so uh, obtuse. I, c I can't even describe it. It's so aggressive. Obscene, Ob I think, is, is, you know, I mean, I, I, we saw this um, previously when Kathy Newman interviewed uh, Dr. Shaban, and bearing in mind that the interview of Dr. Shaban was on the day that the U.S. coalition, including Britain, including Australia, including Denmark, had um, bombed for one hour Syrian Arab army soldiers defending Deir ez-Zor against ISIS, and that, that bombing allowed ISIS to advance into Deir ez-Zor. Um, it, it, you know, and to watch uh, Kathy Newman's Goebbels-esque uh, interrogation of Dr. Shaban on that day, when in reality they should have been apologizing for their regime's um, mass murder of the Syrian National Army. And here again, we have Jon Snow along the same Goebbels-esque lines, um, absolutely in interrogating an MP in Aleppo, an independent MP, who has um, effectively been working to stem the flow of terrorism that has been poured into his country by the very regime that Channel 4 is defending and basically working in lockstep with. And, and it can't be any clearer than from this interview. I was also told by Farah Shahabi that much of what he actually said was edited deliberately edited. Um, well, actually, so Vanessa, a... I, I, I do recommend that everybody goes and finds that, tracks that interview yeah. down and watches the full interview because it's mm -hmm. absolutely clear uh, as you watch that interview that it's been heavily edited. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and that, you know, where is the balance here? And where None. and where's Ofcom <laughs> for that matter? Exactly. You know, as you quite rightly pointed out, Ofcom has been employed to, to demonize and vilify RT. Um, and yet here we have Channel 4 displaying one of the most appalling partisan and biased pieces of, I can't even bring myself to call it journalism without choking on the word because it's so far removed from journalism. It's, it's a joke. It's a satire of journalism. In fact, Channel 4 should be um, possibly uh, celebrating the fact that they've now moved from, from any semblance of serious journalism into pure satire.
Um, absolutely. A couple of people in the chat box just asking for details of that. John Snow was the interviewer, and, and but we'll put the uh, we'll put the link to the interview underneath the uh, video once it goes up on the column website on YouTube and so on. Um, and uh, yeah, again, for the sake of balance, um, we have uh, we have an interview here that you did with uh, Faraz Shahabi. Um, so we're just going to yeah. show that's just very very quick, forty five seconds. We'll show this and then you can comment on it afterwards. Yeah. Uh, this place, uh, when this area was under the Nusra and ISIS occupation and the Free Syrian Army was here, this place here, this factory, was ISIS propaganda center and command center. ISIS leaders used to be in this place, the olive oil factory. So what I did is, I, once this area liberated, this factory was liberated, I turned it into a school to provide secular, free, free secular education for 1,500 students. This is the best way to combat terrorism and jihadi ideology is to provide secular education for these kids who were deprived of any education for more than two years. This opened since June 2014. It's nice to hear the uh, sound of children in the background, Vanessa. Yeah, I mean, um, you know, this was in the Sheikh Najjar industrial area and um, Faris took us to this building, which was um, now it's a, a disused olive oil factory because, as he quite rightly said, he's converted it into a school for 1500 children um, run by um, actually state salaried. So, so Syrian state salaried um, teachers. Now, um, the, the interesting thing was the Sheikh Najjar area was taken over, as he said, actually by ISIS very early on in 2012, and it was liberated in around 2014. So it was under occupation um, for, for those two years. And during those two years, those children in that area received um, no education. Now, this was a common theme. Um, when I went into Hanano, another one of the eastern Aleppo districts that was liberated, we went in literally about 48 hours after liberation. We spoke to uh, Hamid al-Omar, who was the director of one of the schools in Hanano. And what he actually said also was for five years, almost five years, because that, that liberation had taken longer, um, the children were living under a regime, of, as he called it, of enforced ignorance. And even children that we spoke to said that they had had no education for the last five years other than via what we can assume to be extremist sheikhs or imams um, affiliated to the various extremist groups that were um, ruling these areas for the, for the period of time of their occupation, whether it was two years in Sheikh Najjar or whether it was five years almost um, in East Aleppo. So I think going back to the Jon Snow interview, you know, what was extraordinary was this accusation that Farah Shahabi, who, who has demonstrated actually nothing but defending the interests of his people in Aleppo, was being accused indirectly uh, of effectively attacking those very people that he has been defending since the dirty war against Syria um, was started. And, you know, um, Jon Snow also mentions the killing of the 45 civilians. He mentions the bombing of hospitals. The civilians, when we spoke to all of them, all that we spoke to and we asked them, were the Syrian Arab army firing upon civilians trying to leave? They laughed. They said, no. You know, the terrorists were shooting at us. The terrorists were the ones trying to prevent us leaving. So again, you know, we're seeing not only shameless propaganda, but shameless defense of the terrorist actions and, and, and trying to conceal um, the guilt of these terrorist factions that Channel 4 has been defending and cheerleading for for the last five years, defending their actions, murdering civilians, trying to escape their imprisonment. I mean, this, this just can't get any more um, twisted and perverted than, than, than how Channel 4 are, are dealing um, with reporting on the situation in Aleppo. Um, well, we think it can't get any worse, and then it does. <laughs> um, we'll just close this little section <coughs> off with this one, because uh, this is the BBC, uh, once again, The Real Housewives of ISIS, uh, which they think is comedy. Uh, and uh, the quote that the Daily Mail here uh, pulls from it for their headline is, it's only three days to the beheading and I've got no idea what to wear. And 
the, the reaction has been interesting to watch the reaction from the public mm. to this. Uh, there are two very distinct groupings, I think, Vanessa. One is uh, the, the grouping which says, oh, it's, it's fine, it's just a bit of comedy, it's actually very funny and all this kind of stuff is what they say. And on the other hand, there are the people that are quite rightly absolutely outraged by this because what we're talking about here is, is terrorism and deaths and beheadings of children. Mm. I mean, I, I, I spoke to you quickly just before the show, and I, I don't know what astounds me more. I, I guess I'm not astounded that the BBC should try to deflect um, any accusations against the BBC of its supporting extremism in Syria. So I guess, you know, from, from the BBC, it's about as low as we would expect of them. But I guess what astounds me the most is that the BBC has been caught out with its moral pants down regarding Syria. It's been proven to be lying. It's been proven to be supporting terrorism. And yet people in the UK in particular seem to be so ready to move on and to, to, to um, basically defend this, this appalling, abhorrent attempt at, at satire um, by a bunch of UK regime shills that are the BBC that are now making light of the situation that they helped to create in Syria. And also um, without any respect for or consideration of um, the opinion of the Syrian people who do not find this amusing. So in other words, this sort of politically correct, lame, liberal attitude of some of the British public defending it as freedom of speech, but with no consideration, no respect, no empathy for the suffering of the Syrian people that has been exacerbated by this, this excuse for a media outlet um, that is nothing more than a regime shell, advertising terrorism, promoting extremism, exacerbating the suffering of those Syrian people. I'm, re I'm actually really disgusted that people should even consider it acceptable and that they should not be turning um, this freedom of speech uh, claim against the BBC. Why are they not um, saying, OK, if you want to produce satire, produce satire about all of those crimes that you have defended and that you have um, um, promoted? for the last five years, but they're not doing this. They're just limply accepting this as being funny and as being um, an attack on ISIS via comedy. It isn't. Um, it's interesting just to note, to close this off, that uh, both the BBC and Channel 4, of course, um, are both so-called public service broadcasters. What does that yeah. mean? Uh, <laughs> government propagandists, is that, is that the correct definition? Well, it seems to be that way. And, uh, you know, I, again, are the public happy that they're paying three, what is it, 3.7 billion in license fees for this organization to produce this kind of dross? Come on. Where are our standards? I mean, please. Yes. OK, well, look, let's move on um, and let's go to RT because uh, and we're, we're just using this as a as a stepping stone to your own <laughs> your own coverage of, of uh, Aleppo and, and who you spoke to and so on. But uh, when the camera is gone, people leave the, uh, sorry, they leave people under the rubble. This is uh, Aleppo residents speaking to RT and RT uh, journalist about the white helmets and how uh, they actually uh, treat people who are trapped under rubble. Uh, we have mentioned this before, but it's interesting that, uh, that, that we're getting absolute confirmation of this from residents. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, Lizzie Phelan um, actually was on the ground in Aleppo at the same time as I was, but visiting different areas at different times. Um, the testimony that she put out in that article was, was pretty horrifying, actually. One um, gentleman, I think, said that the White Helmets were not rescuing civilians, they were leaving them under rubble to die, a pretty damning indictment um, on the White Helmets. And another um, Guy mentions the fact that he took his baby girl into a so-called white helmet triage center. Um, they injected her and they killed her in the process. Um, so that would, at the very least, cast a shadow over their claims to be fully trained paramedics. Um, and the majority of the testimony, in fact, no, the, universally the testimony that I took from civilians leaving all the various districts of East Aleppo, when asked about the white helmets, we got blank looks 
So we then change the question to, OK, was there a civil defense on the ground? Were there paramedics on the ground? Then, um, to some extent, they recognize what we were talking about. But then they almost immediately, unprompted, said to us, yes, of course, and Nusra Front had their own civil defense. But they were there primarily to help the terrorists. They were not there to help civilians. Um, again, we were told there were no professional doctors um, on the ground, which again <laughs> raises the question about, for instance, Hamza al-Khatib. Um, we were told that the white helmets were facilitating a lot of the um, terrorist actions inside East Aleppo, including, as we know, um, some of the executions they carried out against um, Aleppo civilians. Um, so again, this completely uh, dismantles the, the, the sort of the edifice that is the white helmet image based upon, of course, their own um, footage, their own uh, propaganda and the support they receive, particularly from, from the UK regime. Now, you know, again, my other question would be, where were the white helmets? They were nowhere to be seen during all of my time in East Aleppo. Of course not. They left on the bus um, with Nusra Front. And they are now in Idlib with Nusra Front and the various terrorist and militant factions. They didn't stay behind to help the civilians that they claim again to have been helping for the last five years. Um, right. Well, um, let's hear from uh, some witnesses. Um, um, and we're starting off with children uh, mm. from Jibreen. Just uh, give, <laughs> give us a little bit of uh, background to what we're about to see. Yeah, um, this was actually, I'm trying to remember the dates. This was actually just after Christmas. Um, and we decided to go back to the Jibreen Registration Center, which was the area where all of the civilians um, came to in order to register prior to joining their families in West Aleppo or going to the Jibreen um, refugee camps or being transported on to uh, areas like Latakia um, and Tartus on the coast. So basically, this was the center where over 95,000 civilians registered officially, having left East Aleppo. And we were told there was probably about another 10 percent um, that had not come to the registration center, but had gone directly to families in West Aleppo. So in total, around 110, <clears throat> excuse me, um, thousand civilians left East Aleppo for um, the government held areas. OK, OK, well, let's have a look at this. Then. What do you want to ask her? Uh, what was the most difficult moment for her? In the... فاطمة شو كان أصعب لحظة عشتيها حياتك؟ شو هي؟ It was she said it was in Aleppo. It was difficult from the armed groups, the terrorists. Did she have anything to eat? Did she have anything to eat? شو صار؟ From the shooting, they from the shooting. They were shooting. مين كان ضرب مين كان يضرب؟ the uh, armed groups. Uh, did they have enough to eat? Can I have a meal? No. no. The terrorists were keeping everything? Can I have a meal? Yes. 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 The armed groups there in order to get uh, the, the food and we looted uh, their uh, places. Excellent. Did they have any schooling, any education? Did they go to school at all? Did they go to school or something? No. They used to go to the mosque to study. Okay. And who was teaching them? Who was teaching them? Who was teaching Yeah. Okay. And uh, what were the schools being used for? <laughs> uh, the 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 are their families all okay? Or were any of their families injured? Yes. <coughs> How do you feel now with, the, with being there? 
ليبريتد فروم موسى الهي شو حاسس هلا بعد ما طلعتوا من هنيك يعني شو شعورك بعد ما طلعتوا من هنيك؟ احنا مبسوطين ذير هابي مين كان في مسلحين هنيك؟ بتعرف اسماء المجموعة؟ I ask him what kind of uh, armed groups there are. Do you know the names of the groups? He said no. But they were all uh, armed groups. Yeah, sure, I'm not sure. 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 I'm كل هدول ايه صافي بس في زوار شيء هي سيد ا لوت اوف جروبس ذير وير ذي سترينجرز اور وير ذي بيبل كانوا في غريبين منهم يعني اجانب يجوا منا سودان اسمه سو سوداني سودان سوداني شو لسه يجوا سودان ما بعرف يجوا شو شو سودان غيره بس السودان يجي من اوروبا الواحد حتى المنور تخطيطه they were a mix but he saw a lot of from Sudan كلهم يخوفوا they he said they were scary يجوا لعنا نهزم زي ما الباب حطنا نبرو he said that uh, when when they come we were very afraid we used to close the door and stay inside the house Did the Muslims try to shut them when they escaped? How do the Muslims help you when they escaped? Yes. And they used to attack women with knives. Yalla alhamdulillah salam. Vanessa, the comment in the chat box is that it's amazing that these children are still laughing. This was, um, yeah, I mean, these kids, it's, it's, it's still emotional to actually watch this. Um, these kids were extraordinary. I mean, considering what they had lived under for this length of time, um, part of what we did, actually, um, Pierre Lacoff, who was, who was actually with me uh, when we talked to these children, the day before we, we'd gone with him dressed as Father Christmas to take presents to these children, and, and we were mobbed. We were absolutely mobbed by them. But actually, if you, if you look into their eyes, you can actually see, although they're laughing, and, and because they're kids, they're, they're making light of the situation. A lot of damage has been done in the last five years to these children. And um, one of the, the themes that we heard, not only from Farah Shahabi, but from many people, was that the only way to, to heal these children and to ensure that they're not infected by this extremist disease for the future is through education, through secular education. And um, the, the free education that is available to them in Syria um, is one of the greatest weapons that Syria is using to combat this um, extremism that's been injected into their country, emanating, of course, predominantly from Saudi Arabia. Yes, okay. Well, look, uh, we're uh, rapidly running out of time, so let's just move on. Now, uh, this article that you posted on 21st Century War, uh, mm. just before Christmas, or just after Christmas, IED explosion in uh, Saqqara district of East Aleppo. Uh, yeah. Really, the point here is uh, that uh, as the... Uh, Terrorists were leaving Eastern Aleppo. They left a lot of stuff behind. Uh, and mm. then we've got uh, tweets like this one uh, mm. from uh, Lena Shami uh, saying, Russian forces with Assad and Iran militias defiling the pure earth of Aleppo, <coughs> when in fact what they're doing, uh, because the, the, what she's pointing out is in the photograph, she's showing an image. One of the images is of uh, a Russian uh, soldier riding on the walls uh, of, mm. of Aleppo. But in fact, what they're doing is marking, uh, they're marking buildings which are and areas which have been cleared of mines, and what they're doing is putting yeah. their own lives at risk uh, to yeah. clear these areas of the IEDs that Al Qaeda have left behind. Mm, absolutely, and um, you know when she talks about um, these these Russian sappers defiling the pure earth of Aleppo, no, they're detoxifying the pure earth of Aleppo from the poison that was left behind by the Nusra Front terrorists, with whom she left, by the way, um, on the bus to Idlib. 
Um, so, yes, um, many areas, wherever we drove, you could see entire streets um, with the signage, no mines, which meant that fundamentally um, the civilians were safe to return to their homes. Um, when we were in Sukhari, that area had not yet been um, cleansed of the various booby traps and IEDs that had been left behind. And, and because that was the last area to be liberated, it was the most... Um, densely um, covered by these IADs and mines. And in fact, that day the explosion happened um, literally in the house opposite to where we were standing. Uh, 33 people were, were terribly injured in that blast and um, at least three people were killed. One child, in fact, uh, his mother and father were caught in the blast, and that was on Christmas Eve. So, you know, these Russian sappers, as you say, I think they cleared, I can't remember the figures, but thousands of hectares um, of booby-trapped lands and buildings and residential areas in Aleppo were, were, were cleaned and cleared and made safe by these heroes. There's no other way to describe them. And also not forgetting... Um, the Russian field hostels that were set up um, across East Aleppo to treat civilians that were leaving, having not received any medical treatment for over five years. Okay, and uh, we'll end with uh, with this story mm. here, which I have to say, I had a, a look uh, before the program and I could not find any coverage of this in the British mainstream press at all. Uh, Vanessa, maybe mm. maybe I'm wrong, but but I couldn't find any. Uh, and this, this story of... of uh, of the Damascus water supply. Now, of course, uh, there was a ceasefire called uh, brokered by Russia and Turkey uh, just before Christmas. And that's mm. mostly, as I understand it, mostly holding. Um, but mm. there's this issue of the water supply to, uh, to Damascus, five and a half million in people in Damascus. Uh, and uh, well, what is the situation with the water there? Uh, Early reports were suggesting it was poisoned, and then mm. uh, since then we're hearing that that infrastructure has been uh, damaged. Have you got mm. have you got to the bottom of what has actually happened here? Well, look, the situation is is just before I left Damascus, um, they'd poured I think it was uh, five hundred thousand liters of diesel into this essential water supply for the five million people of Damascus. And uh, who, in fact, who, just sorry, before, you said they poured. Uh, who who poured? Front, sorry, Al Nusra Front. Right, Front right. terrorists. Yeah. Um, and in reality, um, just before I was leaving Damascus, I was seeing um, that, yes, water supply was, was sort of trickling to a halt in Damascus. Um, and there was a lot of panic buying of, of mineral water. Um, then um, I was told that the Nusra Front terrorists and various other militant factions under their control um, had detonated various tunnels under the water supply and under the, the buildings um, and infrastructure of the village that houses that water supply and destroyed it. Now, um, Nusra Front are officially uh, an, a terrorist organization and are therefore exempt from the ceasefire. So the Syrian Arab Army, of course, has been attempting to retake the area in order to secure um, this essential water supply for 5 million civilians in Damascus. And that includes, of course, using their air power against um, the terrorist occupants of the uh, Wadi Barada village and its surroundings. Another point that I want to make um, is that Lina Shami, for example, is constantly citing the magic figure of 100,000 civilians in Wadi Barada. Now, if you, you know, someone only needs to go to Wikipedia to see that in 2004, there were less than 4,000 civilians in Wadi Barada. And to my knowledge, the majority of, of those civilians have been um, managed to, they have managed to get out of the area via yet again humanitarian corridors set up by the Syrian Arab army and its allies. Um, so, you know, let's avoid another entire Aleppo narrative um, where these terrorist supporters like Lino Shami are exaggerating figures. They're, they're, they're lying fundamentally because Nusra Front are not under any ceasefire deal and are legitimate targets for the Syrian Arab army, particularly when they're depriving 5 million Syrian civilians in Damascus of clean water. Um, well, unfortunately, the uh, opportunity to um, avoid an Aleppo-style narrative is not being taken by any of the mainstream press that are actually covering this. 
So here's the Washington Post. A once beautiful valley in Syria is now a microcosm of the country's war. And as you read on down through the text, it's all about how the bombs are raining down daily, uh, deepening the misery on civilians caused by a government opposed siege uh, that has emptied market shelves and left residents relying on wood fires to stay warm in the winter <laughs> cold, and so on. Uh, it's, it's incredible. And who, who has actually written this? Well, it's this lady, uh, Louisa Lovelock, uh, ex Chatham House. Um, I don't think we need to say any more. Um, so, yeah. you know, the, 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 the propaganda continues and will continue, I'm sure. Um, but uh, let's just uh, ask, I just wanted to find out a bit more about this, also from Lena Shami, uh, official statement by civil society organizations in Wadi Barada, urging the international community to hold the responsibility. He's not quite sure what she means by that, but give us, give us the background to this. Well, I mean, this is a statement putting out, of course, yet again, trying to facilitate further foreign intervention to protect um, those mythical 100,000 civilians in, in Wadi Barada. But also what is interesting is that these statements were signed um, by the White Helmets. So yet again, we're seeing the White Helmets participating in what is effectively a war crime, um, chemical warfare against 5 million civilians in Damascus, supporting the Nusra Front narrative, um, and working alongside the militant factions in Wadi Barada. Now, let's have a quick look at the Wadi Barada situation, just, just very simplified version of events. Wadi Barada was under control of Nusra Front. The Syrian government was negotiating, as it is with many of um, these uh, essential infrastructure areas that are held by either ISIS or Nusra Front. They were negotiating with terrorists in order to secure clean water supply for their own civilians in Damascus. Those terrorists who had been benefiting financially from the Syrian government in order to keep supplying clean water to Syrian civilians then poisoned that water. So the Syrian government is left no alternative but to militarily take that area to secure clean water for its civilians in Damascus. Um, this is the logical explanation for this situation, Mike. What Louisa Lovelock, or whatever her name is, is producing for the Washington Post is some fantasy world Nusra Front prefabricated story um, that they have lined up depending on where they next decide. Um, to hit. And, and let's imagine that um, the, if this is prefabricated, which of course it is, you know, how convenient that Nusra Front decide to poison this well at this time and to provoke the Syrian government to militarily attack it, just as Aleppo has been liberated and mainstream media is about to be exposed for the criminal liars that they are. Am I being a little bit cynical on this? Uh, I wouldn't think so. Uh, but uh, the the comment from the Syrian government, of course, is that the people that, that are uh, the, the terrorists that are in uh, that area at the moment uh, are entitled to leave for Idlib as they were from uh, from uh, Aleppo. Um, and uh, we'll just end with this one uh, again from uh, Lena Shami about the demonstrations in Idlib city. This was just uh, just before the new year. Uh, and uh, so this is this is where the, the final gathering is, is taking place. Um, yeah, very much so. And we know that the Syrian Arab army now is making um, huge advances into the southern countryside of Aleppo, um, so towards Idlib in, in reality. Um, so I think, um, you know, what is important now is not to forget the lessons that we've learned from East Aleppo effectively, um, that, that the civilians of both East and West Aleppo were disappeared for five years and their protection was given not one single thought under any humanitarian pretext umbrella by the corporate media, by the UN, by our regimes, and by the various think tanks and NGOs that are effectively um, working against Syria. So we must be bearing those lessons in mind when we are going to be um, moved on to Idlib, let's say, and when exactly the same techniques of propaganda are going to be deployed. They're running out of ideas. They're running out of, of capability. And the reason that they are able, that, that they're not able to now propagandize Idlib in the same way as Aleppo is because of Aleppo. So it's very important that we do not allow the bloodshed of the people 
um, both the civilians in Aleppo and the forces that have um, died liberating Aleppo, we must not allow that to be in vain and we must not allow Idlib to become another Aleppo, not in the way that corporate media will portray it as being another Aleppo, in the way that we know it to be another Aleppo. Okay, well, I think that's, that's uh, a good place to leave it. Thank you very much, Vanessa, for joining us today. Thank you for everybody that watched. Uh, we will be back, as usual, at 1 p.m. tomorrow with David Scott. Thanks for joining us. Bye-bye.